I think I was lucky enough that community found me. So when um, I was at Florida State University and the engineering college is joint with Florida A&M University. And so when I got to the campus my sophomore year, I just had one class, uh, but it was lucky enough that someone said, hey, you should come be a part of the National Society of Black Engineers. And I had never heard of it before, had no experience with it. And I was like, huh, that sounds interesting. So I uh, started going to meetings, um, became really involved. And that's really where I found my community, not only while I was in school, but they are still my community today. They're the people that um, I know they'll go to bat for me when it matters. So that's, that's really, you know, as far as community is concerned, um, I was really lucky in that respect. One of the programs I work with um, is Access Computing, and we're one of the National Science Foundation Broadening Participation in Computing Alliances. And we specifically have resources for students with disabilities studying computing fields. So we are always looking to find new folks, bring them into our community, our mentoring community, and hook them up with resources to go to conferences or do undergraduate research. And so we work with students from across the country. So we'd love to find more folks, um, you know, and seek out advocates and allies in your community. There's probably faculty in your department that have some interest in accessibility or broadening participation, even if they don't know anything about disability. Um, you know, teach them. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, this evening, depending on uh, where you are. Thank you for joining us for the Policy to Practice uh, webinar, Impacts on K-12 Computer Science Education. I am Monika Allen. I am the Program Director for ACE. Um, I am joined by our lovely moderator, Shana Glass, who will introduce our uh, wonderful panelists. So our moderator today is Shana Glass, a member of ACE's steering committee and policy constellation lead. Shana is also the director of education for the Computer Science Teachers Association. Prior to her time at CSTA, Shana spent 16 years in education, including as the program director for K-12 STEM and computer science for all Dean ISD. Shana, please introduce us to our wonderful panelists. Absolutely, and thank you so much for introducing me. I'm gonna start off by start off by introducing Sofia de Jesus. She serves as the Associate Program Manager and Spanish Outreach Director at Carnegie Mellon University's CS Academy and is the author of Applied Computational Thinking with Python, Design Algorithmic Solutions for Complex and Challenging Real-World Problems, with the second edition on its way uh, here in, this, in January. Um, she has over 20 years of experience in education and educational publishing, and she understands the balance need for to reach students and provide environments that allow students to be creative and innovative. Next is uh, Alexis Cobo, soon to be Dr. Cobo. Um, she's working to receive her doctorate in curriculum and instruction in educational technology from the University of Florida with a focus in computer science this next month. Um, prior to beginning her studies, she worked in general studies as well as computer science and educational technology for over the last 16 years. She is currently a research fellow at uh, the national nonprofit CS for All. And Alexis's research interests include inclusive and equitable pedagogies as a means to reduce barriers to the inclusions of students with disabilities in K-12 CS education. Next up is David Lockett, who serves as the Grants Proposal Development Specialist and CIO for the SACS Data Science Academy, promoting data science with robotics and NASA geospatial and extraterrestrial big data for grades 9 through 12. The project combines robotics and big data at the Meharry Medical College School of Applied Computational Sciences. Rudy Escobar is a STEM and computer science coordinator 
who has demonstrated a history of working in education and a strong skill set in STEM pre-K-12 education, science, computer science, STEM, uh, science, technology, artificial intelligence, physical computing, coding, robotics, curriculum design, and engineering ba uh, project-based learning. He currently serves as the CSTA Sacramento uh, Technology Manager. Um, he also contributes to CS for CA, AI for CA, and the NGSS Collaborative. His leadership extends nationally and statewide as the CSTA Board at Large Representative. He serves on this committee, and he also is one of our CSTA Equity Fellows this year. Alexandra Holter is last up and she is the computer science coordinator for Bloomington Public Schools in Minnesota. She also serves as the chapter co-president for CSTA Minnesota, and she is currently one of our co-chairs for this policy committee. Um, she has recently been selected to join her state CS strategy working group, um, which is tasked with developing a strategic plan for long-term and sustained growth of computer science education in all Minnesota K-12 schools, districts, and charter schools. Please welcome the panel. Welcome, all, everybody. So glad to have you. So lots of things have been happening in K-12 education. I think we should start at... What are you seeing with teachers and students in K-12 spaces in your current state and district? Alexander, do you want to kick oh. us off? Or David, one of you? Oh, yeah, I guess I can start up. I'm seeing, you know, a lot uh, more teachers, you know, they're looking at, you know, how are we adopting these policies? They're looking at new professional development. They're, you know, they're looking at growth. You know, how can we get more? Uh, I, I work with students in 9 through 12, but, you know, how can we get more teachers to not only teach computer science, but teach it with fidelity. Uh, you know, we're seeing more funding, uh, you know, being introduced to some of the schools and school systems. So that's what I'm seeing. I'm, I'm seeing growth, you know, I'm seeing, uh, you know, computer science as a whole being introduced to more schools and more students overall. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I think we're also seeing that growth and that excitement, but that's also paired with um, tremendous anxiety and, just um, teachers being overloaded. So I know in Minnesota, we've just passed the Reads Act, which is placing a lot of um, PD time on our elementary teachers. So to talk about CS integration in the elementary spaces right now is really difficult, knowing that that's going to be very taxing for them to take on something else. Um, so it's, it's a double-edged sword, like people see the need for it. Um, it's getting easier and easier to get teachers to buy into why we need um, citizens that are fluent in computational thinking um, but again finding that time to get teachers those skills is really tough i'm gonna have to echo what alex just said now in california we're seeing the same thing there's a lot of funding coming in for computer science and there's a lot of opportunities for teachers and we have a lot of opportunities for teachers that are trying to get into the field of computer science especially ai that brought in this new thing about computer science uh, but um, again, I want to echo what Alex said. It, it's just we're having a, a, a lot of trouble getting those teachers um, that can do so many things. They're already tapped out with so many initiatives that they're having. So it's being a little bit difficult to even add more stuff to them, especially the elementary. Thanks. I appreciate all of your responses. Let's go into maybe what K-12 CS impacting policies are you most concerned about currently and why? Sophia, you wanna kick us off? Sure. So currently there's a lot of push for AI in the classroom um, in conjunction with, or mixing it in with CS education. And I caution a little bit of um, pause for that because the way the AI is being presented is more in line with like educational technology. That's the first and foremost. It isn't as CS, in CS, we would have to discuss like what the models are, how we build them and all of that, um, the define, defining of the algorithms. Uh, but right now we're just looking at tools. So that's first. And then we can't forget all the policies that we have in place to protect our students. For example, privacy. So. If I have students in my classroom that are using these tools, how is their privacy being affected? 
So as a teacher um, in the classroom, I would need to know the privacy policies of those tools, the privacy policies of the parent companies of those tools, trying to figure out what is and isn't being shared from our students. I also have to think um, not just about privacy, but what is the effect of bias and discrimination? Because the tools can sometimes be biased and they say they are. So there's no question, for example, that ChatGPT has biases. They state that. So as adults, the effect that those tools have on us and the bias that we can encounter is not the same as a student who's in development. So a student who is developing their sense of self-worth, um, who is in, you know, they're children. Uh, we have to be very careful about what types of bias and discrimination can be included in some of these tools because they will be affected. So we have to take into consideration policies that do protect them against being introduced to tools that uh, contain those kinds of biases. So for now, I'm there's a lot more, but but I think that currently those are some of the main concerns I have in terms of be very careful about the policies in our states, our districts, and also the policies of the tools themselves and how they affect the children in the classroom. Did anyone want to add? Well, I can kind of add on the, the AI standpoint of that. Uh, recently attended the Seth AI Institutes, and uh, within that, they're expanding AI and they looked at some of the tools with NCS. And they said, hey, you know, how can we make these tools not only equitable, but how can we make sure privacy is protected? So you know, echo echoing off some of those same points is, you know, how can we make sure those tools for all students, you know, not just, you know, 9 through 12, but for K-12 are not only equitable for students, but safeguard their privacy in a way that's, you know, positive to their learning and understanding as well. Yeah, I think I want to jump in as well. Um, I, the we're in an interesting place where do we want policy or not want policy around AI because it is moving so quickly that uh, we need to be able to be flexible and responsive to our students and our teachers. And um, AI is actually really pushing us to a place where um, we're able to get computational thinking and those those skills into classes that we've never been able to get in before. We have um, high school English teachers asking about how do we bring this in and talk about the ethics around this. And we always tell them, well, to talk about the ethics, we really need a base level foundation of what a large language model means, which means that we can talk about algorithms. Um, we can talk about patterns and systems. Um, so this is really opening up the door to places we haven't been able to truly access before because that connection hasn't been seen. Um, and I, I fully agree around data privacy and protecting students, um, but I also just wondering what's that fine line um, that too much policy sometimes limits what we're able to do. And this is a really exciting frontier right now. Yeah, I will add one thing to that though, is that the bias part is important and continues to be important because the people who it will affect the most are always going to be the underrepresented groups. So anything that's biased is going to negatively affect a certain population more than another. So when we look at policies and where we look at whether or not it's okay to use, even if we explain to students the kinds of biases that they're gonna encounter in those tools, it is still going to have an effect. And so that effect is going to affect certain populations more than others. So we just have to be careful about what it is that we're using, how young the students are that we're using them with. But that doesn't mean that I'm not excited for it. There's a ton of excitement and there's a ton of tools that are gonna be amazing for our educational purposes. I do think that some, um, as we start adopting things, it's easier and better to do some teacher facing tools and have some feedback from that a lot more than student facing tools, just so that we can get those biases worked out a little bit more. Um, and then we can go ahead. There's no need to also rush everything uh, in one moment. We can kind of pause and, and check and study and make sure that we're not accidentally uh, inflicting harm on students. But it is a really exciting thing to see. And I was 
I mentioned this in a meeting earlier today, I have no idea where we'd be in three years, which is kind of cool. Also, just to back end this to what Alexandra was starting to say, how all of the sudden teachers who may not have been comfortable having conversations about computational thinking in their classes, while that's while this is all really exciting, we still have to think about the possibility and the impacts on where this conversation lies for issues of access and equity in under-resourced schools, um, in um, populations that are historically minoritized. Um, I, I think that that still has to remain at the front of our mind as policies are being developed, whether it's for AI or CS. Um, I, I think that AI kind of pushes the conversation almost away from making the move towards for all a priority. And that's a danger that I'm personally worried about. I just, I just wanna add to that because you bring us some really good points. And I was in a meeting all day today and we we debated about this, this access piece. And I, um, in light of the code.org report in Minnesota, it's how do we get more students access? Um, and that conversation also needs to be paired with that identity and power component because it's not just having the classes, it's how do we get students to engage authentically in those spaces? And that I think is where we're really struggling. So how do we get policies that also support those equity? I think, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Alexis. I'll, I'll jump in when you finish. Yeah, and I would I would just add, you know, the conversation around AI has become really pertinent with the release of generative AI, AI tools like ChatGPT, but we in the CS community have been thinking about authentic ways of how to integrate AI into our content areas for a long time. This is not something new for us. So I think that, you know, we the pause not only has to come from the fact that we don't want to harm our students, but we want to have these learning experiences be authentic. And as, as others have brought up, there's also this challenge of how do we onboard our teachers and have them be partners with us in this work? And instead of it being this top-down experience because AI is super popular, but we're still on this path and still have such a long way to go to help our students find a pathway that works for them in terms of computer science and where AI fits into that. So I'm gonna come, I'm gonna jump back over to AI and this 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 conversation in a minute, but you did bring up some some valid points. Um Alexandra, I think you were speaking on like how how does the the policies that are coming out, how do they align for all students? And this brings us back to the um, identity inclusive computing policies, which is the premise of the work that you all are doing. Um, the question I have for you all now is around that state of CS report. Um, <laughs> I think this is a good time to bring that into the conversation. What are your thoughts on the state of CS report and its impact on identity inclusive computing? Um, is this one and the same? Meaning, do you see that maybe the state of CS report is aligning to um, to these identity inclusive computing policies um, or um, maybe discuss the need for these policies to be a part of the conversation as this is what's missing. These may be some things that's missing. And just to give you an example um, of how it's creating maybe possibly more inequities um, recently, you know, I have to bring it up, but um, there's a new offering to allow for chat GPT to be used during the APCS principles exam with College Board. They just approved it, yet um, this created more inequities because a lot of school systems block these, these sources, um, these tools, which means that even more students will be further behind in preparation for the exam and even teachers. So that's just an example. Sorry. 
So my thought to you all is, what are your thoughts? Go ahead, Rudy. <laughs> Do you want to go ahead first? I'm still trying to make my thoughts sound nice. <laughs> I think it's okay with this audience that we be forthcoming. Um, the report for the audience, um, the report recently came out two weeks ago. And there was um, lots of talk around the work. And it's represented all of the data that's being represented across the different states. And the push in K-12 education, in CS education, what is it? Like, what are, are these and what are these policies? I'd love to have more conversation and dialogue around what you all see is the initial push from the state of CS report. And is it closing those inequities or is this expanding? Maybe that might help you all. So, so when I think about about you know that conversation and think about uh, you know we can look at that data in different ways, right? So data is good, data could be bad depending on how you portray the data. So the data can be attractive because it says, well, yeah, for example, in the case of California, we are very low on on the level of having computer science in access in computer science. But then at the same time, when you ask that question, Shayna, about the inequities, I think about, okay, so what are some of those recommendations? Let's have an all high schools requirement from now on. And California is a very diverse state where then we start to have issues where not all schools have access and opportunities the same way as everybody else does. So what is the what are those policies, what do those policies do when they go up so thinking so high? without thinking about all the little pieces that are happening in different school districts, teacher shortage that we have a lot in California as well. So all those things does worry me a little bit about how we look at these reports and say, this is one way to go about it. So in terms of, I will add that, going back to, for example, the college board situation, there's a need for us to not include policies that are going to inevitably create, create an unequal opportunities for students. Students right now, if they take that test and some of them are well-versed in chat GPT and use it to do their test, are going to be graded on the same level as a student in a district that has no chat GPT access and have never used it in the classroom. That's necessarily unequal. And that's just not giving students an opportunity uh, to have the same access to tools. Now, I'm not saying that ChatGPT should be included in a college board. Um, I think that that's moving things too fast. But in terms of the report as well, I think that the numbers, you know, I, I always told my students that the statistics is a way for us to say what we want to say and adding numbers to that. And we can make those numbers look however we want because we have biases that we incorporate in there. Um, and so statistics can be shown in very different ways. Uh, we can say that, you know, 57% of schools have, um, are offering CS, but then we look at the footnotes and we say that 5.8% of students who are actually taking CS uh, in high schools. And part of the reason for that is how we're counting. So we need to look more in depth as to who is actually in the schools that have these classes and which classes are being offered. How are they being offered? For example, am I counting a school that has 1,500 students, one elective that serves 30 students a year? That's, that's not accessible, it's available. There's an available class in that school. Am I counting that school? That's only serving 30 of those 1,500 students. So we need to look more in depth. And then who are those students that are being served? Is it 50-50 boys and girls? Is it, what about the students with disabilities? Are they included in there? Multilingual learners, are they in there? Um, uh, do, do my vision impaired students have access to CS? What are all of the things that are needed in order for students to actually have access, are those being considered? Um, and I know, I, I, I've I heard so many times um, in my role, I do work with some districts in some states and some countries. And, and a lot of the times when they adopt a graduation requirement, I ask, what's your plan for your disabled students, your students with disabilities, your students 
uh, with vision impairment, your students with um, any any type of need, and their answer most of the time is we'll make an exception. And that's just adding to the gap that exists between access for different communities. So that shouldn't be our answer. Um, and and I, I know that there's a lot of work to be done there, uh, but I do think that we can do better in the way that we collect and share data um, so that we know more about the numbers of each group, not just necessarily, because um, a lot of the things are, are based on race and gender, um, but there's a lot more in terms of identity inclusive besides just race and gender. Building upon what Sophia just said, it's clear from the report that there's a push for access and participation, meaning having a course offered and having folks counted in the course, and that's it. But the quality of what might be offered is very different. And if we're looking at this as well from an identity inclusive lens, one of the tenants from K to 12 is to provide comprehensive educator preparation. So how are we doing that if we're just kind of racing to say courses are offered and students are receiving the course? I think that that's a big red flag. Yeah, I, I can kind of add to that point as well. You know, looking at the red flag, you, know, you look at all the different state level policies, but when you're building equitable pathways and you're broadening participation, how are you doing that? Is that truly for every student? You know, are you looking at the pathways for teachers? Are you giving them the professional development and the training that you need? You know, we, we've got, you know, funding that's being distributed to specific states. You know, we've got decentralized data and we've got this growth. But how are we building those equitable pathways? How are we broadening participation in a way that's equitable to all students? Uh, identity and understanding. Excellent, excellent. And um, we have a question that kind of aligns with that, um, David. We have been hearing um, in different facets that, you know, there's lots of funding out there. There's lots of funding for CS education. Um, however, recently um, with this new these 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 shiny new approaches to AI and K twelve, they're shifting their focus. They're shifting their focus from computer science education to let's give it to, um, well we could use this in a in teaching AI and K twelve. The question is, where are the funds for K twelve CS coming into schools, and what should teachers and leaders be looking for? to fund these best practices, maybe this teacher PD. I'm curious to hear you all's thoughts on what you're seeing when it comes to funding K-12 CS education. I'll jump in. Um, I, I can only speak for my state. So again, I'm in Minnesota and most of our funding is coming from the local level. So it's the districts, it's through tech referendums, it's through micro grants. Um, we were able to get some funding with our most recent and only CS Ed legislation, which passed last year. Um, we asked for four million, and we got half a million. So um, again, it's not zero. So we're gonna celebrate the small wins. Um, but I d I don't know where the funding comes from, especially for schools who um, are already are already taxed. I mean. Getting grants really requires somebody on your staff who has the time and the expertise to do it and go after it. So, um, uh, again, I think that just kind of adds on to the inequities we're seeing. So I can share um, some of my experiences in terms of funding. I work um, for Carnegie Mellon University and we have a project. So our project provides free curriculum um, for schools and free PD. But the thing about that is that that free PD, we can offer it virtually, right? So sometimes we'll work with districts who want something in person. 
but we don't have funding for that or we may not have funding for that in that moment because again we don't charge um so they so districts will work um with their states and to try to see what types of funding they could use in order to get us there so that we can provide the training um that comes from different grants different um things that they've done through uh, federal funding. Some of them work with NSF grants. So like, for example, in Puerto Rico, there's some NSF grants that allow for um, professional development to be done. Um, but as a project ourselves, we need funding. So that funding can sometimes come from other organizations. Um, and it is a little limited because usually that funding is geared towards interests that align, right? And right now there's a lot of alignment with AI um, tools, but not necessarily for the CS itself. So, um, so part of what we need to be doing always uh, is looking for those areas of funding and looking at NSF grants or looking at partnering with organizations that are providing um, funding in order to address the needs of students because the other piece of that is um, funding specifically for adding accessibility to tools is really hard to find and that funding is necessary because to make tools accessible is expensive. Um, we need developers who are well versed in how to serve those students. Um, and that that type of thing is not just, you know, as an organization, but like states and having experts to be able to work with all of the different students and their needs. Um, but once you meet the needs of one group, you're meeting the needs of many other groups. So it's just also um, it's important for all of us to be sharing with the people that we work with, with the districts that we work with, all of the ways that advances in CS education necessarily serve so many more than what you see initially. Uh, I can kind of add to that point too. On a federal level, I see a lot of omnibus spending for AI. Uh, I see lots of AI requests for fundings, you know, from the National Science Foundation, from the Department of Defense, from the National Institute of Health. Uh, you know, I, I get this question asked a lot, you know, how can I get funding on a local level? And a lot of times with larger school systems, you know, you're looking at uh, federal, you know, you're looking at credit unions, you're looking at private foundations, you're looking at public foundations. And that's what can, you know, ultimately fund your school or school system. Uh, within a lot of the, you know, recent solicitations and requests for fundings, they're all AI driven. And I, I see them every single day looking for different programs. But within those AI funding components, a lot of institutions of higher education, they're writing in components for computer science. They're writing, you know, computer science modules. They're writing certification pathways for students. So that's how I'm, you know, how am I looking, you know, how am I seeing the funding and where it's going? Yes, it's, it's going to AI right now, but there's still funding for CS and it's there. You know, I saw a CS for all uh, request for funding here recently. So there's, you know, there's the pathways are definitely there. You, know, you have to be creative when you're looking. You have to be very creative in the program that you design and develop and, you know, try to broaden participation and reach as many students and faculty uh, as you can. Thank you so much for all of that. Now, I'm going to circle back to our original conversation, which it keeps sneaking in. Ironically, we are trying to focus on computing, yet we see all the recent emerging technology initiatives, such as this new national AI policies that are coming down that are about to be drafted uh, for K-12 education that may or may not be aligned to identity inclusive policies, identity inclusive computing policies. How will this impact computer science teachers and students? Or how do you see this impacting computer science teachers and students? And more so, how is this going to potentially impact CS education as a whole? Rudy, you wanna kick us off? Yes, I, I guess I can kick us off a little bit. <clears throat> So I, I think that one of the things that I'm that I'm noticing that I that I'm also fearful of is that there is a lot of push for this AI technology and AI you know usage and although I agree with what Alex has said a little bit ago about you know it, it's an opportunity to bring in new teachers to 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 this uh, to this group it it seems like the push is more for the usage of the technology than to actually learning about the technology 
And that, that is a fear that I would have because I think that that is pushing us in a different direction when you can have, we've had so much trouble trying to get CS into schools. And now we're having where they're opening up in some districts, they're opening up uh, AI opportunities and some are not. And then some of them might have CS and some of them might not. So we're just, if when we think about these policies, we're thinking about that. We're really making a divide, a greater divide in between um, the usage of uh, CS and, and, and AI is just giving us more more push for the usage, which everybody, uh, a lot of people that, that are, a lot of uh, uh, leadership is accepting this versus the ones that are um, not accepting it. And it's becoming a problem. Anybody want to add to that, Alexis? So I want to bring up um, an opportunity that I had before I entered graduate school when I was a CS teacher, being part of the AI for K-12 working group. And what I really enjoyed about that experience was I was a teacher brought in to think about how to incorporate AI concepts um, in the grade band which I worked three to five, grades three to five, and having these conversations with these incredible researchers and advocates and policymakers from around the country and sitting there advocating from the teacher's perspective, um, how will we add these concepts and skills at the elementary level at that point from where I was sitting into our CS content? Um, and this was in 2019, pre-pandemic. And, you know, it's super important to think about, A, when adding something new, um, having practitioners alongside of you, um, and this would be something that I would say is important when advocating in general, that if you are in a position to bring teacher voices of all different um, capacities alongside of you, that that will impact how it's implemented in the classroom and can impact student outcomes. Um, so I think that that's super important. So AI has already been thought of from a broader perspective for a long time, like I said before. And so I think we have to lean on the work that an organization like AI for K-12 has already done rather than you know thinking like we have to start all over um, again. To echo what Alexis was saying, practitioners, teachers need to be part of every conversation. There's a um, there's a divide that happens a lot in every discipline. This is not CS related only, um, but there's a divide that happens between academic research and practice. Um, and so we need to not do that uh, because a lot of times it's just so disconnected that the research is just behind the practice because teachers are doing all the work anyway and they've already beyond what the research is telling them to do and so that's why there's a lot of there's a lot of um back and forth there and um a lot of feelings but but that's why teachers need to be part of the conversation they've already been doing a lot of the things that researchers are trying to figure out um and there's also the need to listen to other groups at the research side. Um, women in AI ethics have been doing a lot of work. There's a lot of um, there's a lot out there for us to look at and see and hear in terms of some of the um, things that could go wrong because of how we implement. So. We need to ensure that we're not just, and I know I say shiny a lot, but it's it, there's a shiny little object and, and, and we kind of just get distracted by that shiny object and forget to look at what that shiny object is affecting and who is affected by that shiny object. And so there's a lot of need for the conversations to happen with a lot of levels in the same room. So now let's talk to the teachers and then let's talk to the researchers afterwards. Or like, no, it has to be in the same room. There has to be, because teachers have 
a wealth of knowledge and data at their hands that they might not have published, but they definitely have it. So, um, so it's just important. And I, I just want to echo what Alexa said, teachers have to be part of this. Otherwise we're going to create a lot more issues than we solve. I want to go back again to what Alexa said as well, just because, um, you know, there's, so those of us who have been working with AI stuff for years know that there, like what she mentioned about AI K-12, there's already a lot of work that has already aligned to the policies that we have that we're thinking about already the inclusiveness we're thinking about identity and i mean if anybody hasn't seen those resources they're great resources and those are things that we need to think about instead of trying to push now to the shiny thing that sophia talked about that we have in the edtech world now that is trying to push towards let's use ai let's use this technology and a lot of push towards that and we're still we're starting to get that uh, leave that space in between what cs is and what the usage of ai is and we have to be very careful with that to go back to the basics and use and allow what it's already out there support that work and use that as the frame i i feel like both of these things have to be true like yes with ai we're chasing after this shiny thing as, as people have said but there's also the reality that our seniors are going to graduate into a world where this is integrated into their workflow. Um, Windows will have Copilot there. There's Copilot for coding. I mean, students need to know how to use these responsibly, safely, and ethically right now. Like, this isn't a wait and see thing. Um, but I think that what you're saying about like, yeah, we've, we've already got some of these things in place where we don't need to go reinventing the wheel. And I think the K-8 space is perfect because in the district I'm in, like we've got a 13 and up user policy around chat GPT. I mean, we don't, they do, but what do we do with our K students and they can't access this tool? We can lean on those other resources that have been built. We can really get into computing. We can get into CS um, because we're seeing the support for that. Like, they understand it's not appropriate to be having these kids engage in these AI generative chatbots. That's fine, but it is completely appropriate to have them start to understand all the components of CS, which hopefully I don't have to go into here. Um, I just, I think it has to be both and we, we have to balance balance that because our, our students right now can't wait for us to figure it out. So one of the things that I do wanna mention here, sorry, Alexis. <laughs> um, I, I hesitate anytime somebody says they'll have to see it later. Um, they'll have to use it later. There's an appropriate moment and appropriate time for that to happen. And it doesn't, students use a whole lot of things that we don't teach them in school. Um, and so there's there's not, I think we, we need to be careful about equating they'll need it for work later to they'll need to learn it in school because those two things don't necessarily have to go together. Now, I do think that we need to teach them how to responsibly use it and all of that. Um, but I do, again, need to make sure that we remove those biases first. If we have not removed the biases, then the answer couldn't be yes, because we are going to be hurting specific subgroups, specific students. Alexis, sorry. That's okay. I also just wanna um, lift up the fact that there are still school districts that can't use tools such as Scratch because of their policies against um, COPA and FERPA. So to be considering using AI tools over free resources when so many schools are underserved, I, I just think we're, we're having the wrong conversation when schools can't even use these other tools. Um, so I, I caution jumping in other directions when we need to get schools the tools that they need to first even have their foot in the door. That's why to me, the red flags in the State of CS report are access versus participation. And we wanna move them to quality experiences that are authentic and representative of the students' lived experiences. So I'm gonna jump in. Uh, as I'm listening to you all, I have this this epiphany of of another question. Um, we are seeing not just these policies, uh, these new the new shiny object, but we're also seeing a lot of differences um, in the face of what's going on 
politically in our country um, that are directly impacting K-12 teachers and uh, more specifically CS, those those few K-12 CS teachers that we have. Um, and you all are from all over the country. Um, we have Pennsylvania, uh, DC, Tennessee, <laughs> Florida, California, Minnesota, Texas. We're from vastly different parts of this great United States. Um, some of the policies, even in the state of CS report, we're seeing, you know, there's policies that's making identity inclusive computing inaccessible to teachers and students because of some of the policies that they are setting forth um, across the country. What are some ways that you all feel that we can combat this or even support teachers to be able to combat and protect them, right? What are, what are you all, what are you perceiving? Maybe some supports. Uh, I would say, you know, make your voice known and make your voice heard. The White House has a series of listening sessions to where educators can join. I think they give you a minute or two minutes and you can say, this is my point. This is the research that backs it up. This is how we're going to combat that. And that's, I, I think I joined every single one multiple times just to share, hey, this is what I'm seeing in CS. This is what I'm seeing in AI. So, you know, joining those White House listening sessions is one way that you can make your voice known and heard to help enact change on a local level. I also would say organizing in a way that you're providing teachers a space to come together over a common goal um, to learn about how to practice identity inclusive computing um, to where they feel like their voice can be heard is super important. Yeah, I would. I would just add to that that teachers don't have to stop their own learning, regardless of what's happening in their state. And I've always been impressed with CSTA's equity fellows and the type of PD they're able to put out. Um, so I would I would look for those national organizations that are able to still support that learning. And I'm going to add to that just to to think about way different ways that that that, that you can learn uh, those things that are that can be blocked by your state because you know we know the reality some of some of some people cannot stand up to whatever is out there for their state so they're they're they have to be careful and you have to know how to address things so it's just find opportunities like uh, alex said look for those natural organizations that can help you even with some of the language that needs to be used but it's still to be including everybody i just want to add that um having been in places where you can't uh, be fully yourself and now in a place where I can fully use my voice, those of us who have that privilege uh, need to use it um, because the only way to make change is to ensure that everybody has access to this privilege of being able to say like, hey, here I am, this is who I am. This is how I work with CS education and not everybody has that right now. Um, so I think that it's important for us uh, who do have the voice to use that voice um, for those who can't. So we have a, a couple of more questions that came through before I give, give a closing question. Um, how can we navigate this current politicized climate that's prohibiting curriculum? on race and gender while also making sure we're educating students in STEM on these topics? And what about the impact of technology on different communities? Which is similar to our question, but it's an extension. Um, curious uh, if you all have an answer. So I think that in terms of providing curriculum, we need to be sure that like if we're creating curriculum, that curriculum needs to be inclusive. So there have to be videos that show all sorts of different students. They have to be uh, as accessible as humanly possible. Um, and the more accessible we make things, the more accessible they will be because the more people can use them and then they can give feedback and then we can make them more accessible. So um, I will keep plugging that one, um, but we need to make sure that the content is accessible. Uh, Cause even if you don't mention identity, if your videos 
demonstrate different identities, you're still very much sharing that with students. Um, and I, I want to say that we need to move to being completely open about like being able to be fully yourselves in the classroom. But we need to make sure that they have as much as humanly possible that's not going to get them, you know, uh, fired because I that that's we want to make sure that the teachers are also safe. Um, and that's it's a hard thing to be when you want to be fully yourself uh, and you are not allowed to be uh, based on some policies in your state or district. So so I do think that we as so and I say we because I am a curriculum provider, we have a responsibility to ensure that what we put out there is as inclusive and accessible as possible so that teachers who may not be able to say it out loud can still see it. Adding to that question, we have one from a state lead who says that they also remind uh also remind all that states that school districts at the local level are where policies are set and what resources are there to share with local school boards that may lack the important content guidance any recommendations or any suggestions from that from that lens i think a great starting point would be to engage with the local csta chapter and be able to bring them into the conversation. Um, so that way they can provide hopefully some content area expertise if they don't have a state CS representative. Um, but again, it's building that partnership with practitioners um, who are in the trenches and working with the students. Um, I also wanna add to what Sophia was just sharing. I think, if you're looking for ways to navigate in this type of climate, leaning on resources such as the k Center, culturally responsive uh, CS framework, looking at um, a project that I was a part of as a graduate student from Dr. Maya Israel, Universal Design for Learning for Computer Science, our website, for resources, the ACE Alliance, um, all these different resources that are giving you content that is identity inclusive. I, I would say that this is an easy starting point that will, that will help guide teachers, state, local leaders to have the language and the tools and the framework to be able to navigate in this type of climate. So we have one more excellent question. Um, how can youth or undergraduate students get involved in this advocacy work for inclusive and equitable K-12 CS education? Seeing as though all of you come from various different lenses and so, uh, to support either students directly or the teachers who support those students, we really love your input um, and recommendation of where students can go or youth can go to support the work that you all are doing. I think that one of the ways, at least what I see with us is uh, get in touch with uh, county offices or departments of ed, if there's possible, something that is close by to them. Uh, again, what Alexis mentioned about CSDA chapters, there's a lot of CSDA chapters, local chapters that can also welcome these undergrad students. We are actually doing that with our AI for CA group that we are welcoming undergrads. And that's an opportunity for them to, to connect and to start, start to see some of the work that, that is being done and at the same time, begin to uh, to learn how to advocate uh, in in this uh, uh, in this group. One of the spaces that had the most impression on me, as well as the students that I've worked with, is being a robotics coach. Um, the first organization, first Lego for um, elementary school students, the first tech challenge, first robotic challenge has really made an impact on many students that I've worked with and given them tools to help them advocate as well as scholarships um, and given them a place where they feel like they have a voice to really um, show who they are. I, I would highly encourage students to check out different out of school time providers um, as well as, you know, like Rudy said, um, school counselors, um, and then also organizations like NCWIT that give 
um, undergraduates an opportunity to continue and provide mentorship for them. Okay, I can add in as well. Look at some of the various federal agencies, NASA, National Science Foundation, Department of Defense. There, there's all kinds of opportunities for students, you know, uh, whether it's K-12, undergrad or graduate students. So uh, looking at these different programs, you know, they're, they're laid out in a way that are, you know, comprehensive for understanding and can, you know, build on pathways for students. So definitely check out some of the, you know, federal agencies that have opportunities available. And I just want to add that there's a lot of advocacy that is done by students in K-12 and undergrads without us, the adults in uh, in the room. They have, I've seen incredible work, incredible organizations come from their advocacy. Uh, so I would urge anybody who's interested to see what others have done and try to figure out how to best serve the communities they're in. Uh, of course, if you see any one of us, I'm sure we we are happy to talk um, to students as well. Um, but I, I I would just say don't wait for the adults. Sometimes they can get so much done uh, by using their voices. Um, so I would encourage them to do so. The final question I have for you all is this: this is called the policy committee. This is the CSDA educator led. Um, a teacher-led policy committee, yet um, we have two lenses of duality. And we've discussed that this is one where we address policy, but also um, are working to build teacher or um, leader advocates uh, in advocacy. So what advice would you give to K-12 teachers regarding advocating? Um, what is one thing you would tell them to do when in regards to advocating for CS education in like, a, a 60 second elevator pitch, <laughs> 60 seconds or less. I would say start with, if it's a teacher, start with your, whoever can support you at the administrative level. So whether it's an assistant principal or a principal or a counselor, begin with somebody that, is, that can join forces with you. So that way you can begin. That's how I started. So I started with one principal and the principal helped me to move forward. So I think that that was the first thing to do. Find the, the closest person that you have that has some some uh, some way of moving things more than you. So that way you have a way to move forward. I would add, depending on your goal as a teacher, if it's just to create awareness around CS, like be your own cheerleader. I mean, get stuff out there about what you're doing in your classroom and send send your local representative you know, images from your classroom and tell them what you're doing. The thing I hear from our representatives is, what does this even look like in a K-8 space? Um, so show them what it looks like, um, help people understand uh, why it's important and the joy it brings. Um, so nobody's gonna do it, just get out there and show off, just show off. <laughs> Building upon that, while it's not as uh, safe of a space anymore, social media, that's how I started um, building my community and finding my voice as a CS educator, but showing just pictures from my classroom led me to connect with other educators and finding strategies and practices and resources, so being open to sharing what your room looks like. Uh, I can add, make your voice known, email your representatives, call them, uh, you know, ask them for funding, you know, say, are there funding opportunities available? Uh, you know, attend meetings, you know, they're going to say, hey, you know, this teacher's invested, let's see what we can do. So make your voice known. I appreciate you all. I know the audience does as well. Um, I want to give you all a round of applause and thank you for spending some time with us today. I think we are we are coming to an end. I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much, Shana, and to our wonderful uh, panel for your insights and your advice and your experience. Um, just a few reminders, the recording for today's session will be available in a few days on our website under resources. And uh, we just dropped the link for our next uh, event, which is a conversation with the ACE Student Advisory Board. 
uh, considering identity and inclusion in computing spaces uh, scheduled for Tuesday, January 23rd. It's not often that we get to hear directly from the people that are impacted by the decisions and things that we're doing. So um, that will be a great conversation to um, just come in and, and listen in on. Uh, thank you so much again, and we hope you all have a good night. Thank you.